Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. Thank you for revelation you're bringing forth from the word of God as we thank you for bringing the revelation of all that you've accomplished in the great redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We praise you for all that you do this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We're going to begin to share with you on the subject of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, God's plan of redemption, and talk about these things. The reason we would do this is because this is the time of the year, of course, to do this. And we might even show you for a moment. This is the calendar. You can see it somewhat. In 30 AD, the Hebrew calendar. And we see that Nisan, where we see it right here, Nisan is the first month of the year. And Nisan day one at this time was here, at this time of the year was in March. And we come to the 14th day of Nisan, which is Passover. That was on a Wednesday, if you see. This would be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And that's the day that Jesus was di did die. And then there were three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, the 15th, 16th, and 17th. And after that, then he was raised from the dead and fulfilled the Feast of First Fruits. And that was on the first day of the week, which was be the 18th day of Nisan at that time. Now, this year, the calendar changes <coughs> from year to year because it's not based on the sun. It's the lunar calendar. This is the calendar for 2021 in relation to the Hebrew calendar. Nisan day one, as we had mentioned to you, was March 14th, right here. That was the beginning. That's the first day of the year from God's standpoint. When we go to the 10th day, which is the day that Jesus came in and presented himself, that was on a Tuesday, and that would be parallel to the 23rd, which really would be yesterday. And then we come to the 14th day, which wasn't on a Wednesday, in this time, the 14th day of Nisan is on a Saturday this year. And then there would be the three days and three nights and then the 18th. So it doesn't line up with what was happening back then. So we really can't do it on those specific days because of the way that the calendar works out. But nonetheless, we'll be sharing this information beginning now, talking about this, because this is the time when we proclaim the work of Jesus Christ, the great, wonderful, redemptive work. But we're going to begin talking about this all from the very beginning that we see in Genesis chapter 1. <coughs> in Genesis chapter 1, we need to understand what has begun to happen. It says in, King, in the King James, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. First of all, the word heaven is plural, heavens, and this is not exactly what it says in the Hebrew, because this is not the main subject and verb in this particular statement here. This is a clause in the Hebrew, and that is important to understand. And we come to verse 2, when the earth was without form, void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. These are three more clauses. None of these are the main verb and the subject and the verb in the sentence. The main verb in the sentence doesn't come until Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, where God said, let there be light. And that's important to understand. The reason why we say this is there have been those who have taught that they think that God created the heaven and the earth, that it was done, and then there was some type of cataclysmic occurrence that happened in which everything it was all destroyed, and so the earth was all destroyed, and God then had to do a redo of it. It's all a lie. This is what's called the gap theory, where they think that between Genesis 1-1 and before Genesis 1-3, when he speaks about light, <coughs> They think that there was a millions of years, the gap, this is called the gap theory. It's all a lie. Many people believe this today. It is a false teaching. And we wanted to point this out to begin with. First of all, when we talk about this, 
this here in the beginning, again, this is a clause, and it really means in the beginning of God's preparing the heavens and the earth, or, or in creating the heavens and the earth, it's a clause. It's not saying that it happened, a factual statement at that. It's just talking about a, a clause of what was about to happen. And then in verse 2, the earth was without form, it means it was formless, what hadn't been formed yet. It was void, meaning the fact that it was empty, nothing had filled it up yet. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, meaning there was no light yet. Darkness was still, and there was no light whatsoever. The deep is talking about the waters. And here we see the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God is the one who performs the Word of God. He's moving or hovering over, this means, the face of the waters. And what's he ready do, to do? He's ready to bring forth the creation of God that God is going to speak into being. Well, we come to verse 3, and this is where we see the creation began. God said, how does he do everything? Through his word, speaking words. Let there be light, and there was light. There was no light before that. Darkness was there. So he spoke light into being. Once light comes into being, it's here. And so he spoke the light into being, and he saw the light was good, divided the light from the darkness, called the light day, the darkness he called night. And notice also, he said the evening and the morning were the first day. That tells you something that'll be important down the road, that God's day starts with the evening, not when it's daylight. So if you think of the evening, like let's say like 6 p.m., that's when the day really begins from God's standpoint. And then the morning is kind of the second half of the day when it's the time of the day. That was the first day. And that's the way it is on all of them. <clears throat> then we come to verse 6. God said, let there be a firmament. The firmament means an expanse, an expanse, a separation in the midst of the waters, an expanse. So we have these waters, and now we have an expanse in the midst of the waters. And it says, it divides the waters from the waters. Well, how were they divided? He made this expanse, divided the waters that were under this expanse, from another expanse, from the waters that were above. So if you can see that picture, there's waters above and there's waters below. And there's a big expanse in the center of that. That's the way when God did things to begin with. He called the, the expanse heaven and the, the heavens in this particular area. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Notice it always starts with an evening and then it go, ends with a morning for a day. Then he says, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. They're the lower waters. Be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So here's when the earth came into being. He called the dry land earth. Gathering together the water, he called seas and saw that it was good. So now he forms the earth and the waters below become the seas of the earth. So, by the way, what we have then is we have the earth with the seas, we got this expanse, the heaven, and then we got these waters above, which we haven't seen anything about yet at this point. Verse 11, he begins to bring forth, the earth bring forth the grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, the seed is in itself upon the earth. So now he's bringing in all this vegetation. And we come to verse uh, 13, and he says, the evening and the morning were the third day. We come to the fourth day. Now he begins, he says, let there be lights in the firmament or the expanse of the heaven, that middle area, to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs, seasons, for days, and for years. That's their purpose. Let them be for lights in the expanse of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. So he made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. <clears throat> greater light would be the sun, the lesser light would be the moon, a reflection of it. And then we have all the stars. They're all in that expanse area. He set them in the firmament in the heaven to give light upon the earth. So we come to there. This is to rule over the day and over the night. And we divided the light from the darkness, saw that it was good. And that was the end of the fourth day. We come to the fifth day. And now he's bringing forth the moving creatures in the seas, and he's bringing forth the fowls that fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven. And he's creating all the rest of the ones, the whales and living creatures and the waters and winged fowl, and saw that it was good. And 
And he says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters and the seas, and let the fowl multiply. So they begin to multiply. That's the fifth day. Now we come to the sixth day. God had set everything up ready for what he really wanted to bring forth, which was man. He said, let the earth bring forth a living creature after his kind, cattle, creeping thing, beasts of the earth after his kind. So now he's bringing in the animals. Made the beasts of the earth after his kind, cattle after their kind. So it was all good. And then he says in verse 26, let us, that's a plural pronoun denoting the plurality of the Godhead, was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And notice this word, number 1823, we're going to see a form of this word, 1819, a little bit later. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God is made in the very image of God, and he's given dominion and authority over the earth. We see, it's, here he says, when he created man in his own image, in the image of God, created him male and female, created them. This is a summary of what was going to happen, but he hadn't created the female yet. This is a summary of what he did. Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Now we have to comment about that. People that have believed in the gap theory that there was a earth and then it was destroyed and then there was a redo, another one. They look to this replenish and say, see, replenish means fill it again. Well, that's not what the word means in the Hebrew. It simply means to fill, not fill again. It means to fill. So people have not have failed to look this up, so they believe lies and thought it was a redo. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And so God, of course, gave the herb-bearing seed upon the face of the earth, every tree, for the fruit of the tree yielding seed, it be for food for them. And he gave all these things and, and set the green herbs and everything in place. So he saw everything was good, the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So he had now had accomplished this work in six days. And so the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them, and the seventh day he ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his works that he made. So we see the seven days it speaks of creation. These seven days, six days, was we made all these things, and the seventh day it speaks of God resting. Now, we also see how he specifically brought man into being in verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. His body comes from the earth. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that would be the spirit that came from him, and he became a living soul. So now that produced life. The spirit is the life that comes into us and it produces us to become a living soul with a soul of a will, intellect, emotions, personality. He brought that all into being. And then, verse 8, Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he formed. He made a garden. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight, good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden. What tree's in the midst of the garden? The tree of life. And then it also says, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Doesn't tell you where that one is, but it's in the garden somewhere. But the tree of life is the one that's in the midst of the garden, which is important, which you'll see. Now, what's the purpose of why God did all this? Remember, God already was in existence, and he already had all these angels that he had already created. There were created beings. And we come to Isaiah chapter 45, and we see in verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. That was the purpose. I am the Lord, and there is none else. And why did he create man specifically in his image? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 tells us here, This cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. God wanted a family. So he made man, male and female, they could reproduce, 
in the image of God, to have a family. That was his purpose. Now we must note that in Psalms 24, verse 1, he says, The earth is the Lord's. It belongs to him. He's the owner of it. And the fullness thereof, the, wor and the world, they that dwell therein. At the same time, in the fact that the earth is the Lord's, we see something that he did in Psalms 115, verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. He's retained that. But the earth hath he given to the children of men, even though he's the owner of it. He gave it to the children, or the sons, this means, of men, which would be mankind. Adam is the word for really men, or really it refers to mankind. Now this giving of the earth to the sons of men or mankind, remember he's the owner, so this wasn't a giving that now they became the owner. Instead, it is a lease that he gave to them. Luke chapter 20, in verse 9, he speaks of a parable. He began to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, that would be essentially type of the earth, with the garden. He led it forth to husbandmen, which is mankind, went into a far country for a long time. Now, when it talks about letting it, this word let refers to a lease, like you're le leasing something out for hire. It is a lease that it's talking about. He gave man a lease. If you look it up in Freiburg's, it talks about it, it uses this word lease is what it means. So God gave man a lease for a period of time to have dominion and to rule the earth. Now remember the seven days of creation. They point to the time period of earth. The reason is because we see in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Beloved, be ignorant of this one th be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So the seven days are a type of the seven thousand year period of the earth. The earth is going to be seven thousand years is all it's going to be before there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. The teaching out there that says there's been millions of years, or you listen to the world, they always talk about the millions and millions of years, is all a lie. That's all so-called science thinks they have known, known this, but it's not so. If there were millions of years, it'd be in the Word of God. That's the truth. It's nowhere in there whatsoever. It's only 7,000 years. And remember, six days were the creation. Six is the number of man in Scripture. And the seventh one was the time of the rest, when the Lord would rest. The 6,000 years were the time of man's rule on the earth. The lease was for 6,000 years. And then the seventh one, which is the seventh day, would be the 7,000 year period. That is the time when he is going to rule and he's going to reign. Now some people have tried to say, well, how can you know that this is really talking exactly about 1,000 years? Well, God made it real clear in Revelation chapter 20 when he talks about this millennial reign of Jesus after the 6,000 years is finished. He speaks of this 1,000 years in five consecutive verses time after time. He makes it real clear. Revelation 20 verse 2, He laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a 1,000 years. Cast in the bottom pit, the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal upon him, deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. Then he would be loose for a certain se little season. And then he speaks here again, and he comes down at the end of this verse, he says, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is the millennial reign of Jesus. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished, because they're going to stay dead. They're going to be, all the ones that are the unrighteous dead are going to stay in hell for that thousand year period. And then we come again to verse uh, 5. He talks about the rest of them didn't live. Then verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no authority. This is the word exousia. It means authority. They'll be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him 
a thousand years. So this is the time of the reign of Jesus Christ, and we are going to be here to reign with him. We're talking about the righteous saints. So here we see five verses talking about a thousand years. You better know it's a thousand years. It's not just some other time. So the six days is the 6,000 years of man's lease to rule and reign in, over the earth. The 1,000 years, the final one, is the time of God's rule and reign over the earth. Now we see something else talking about, that remember God was made in his image. In Psalms chapter 8, we come to verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou hast visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower, it says, than the angels. Did God make man lower than the angels? No. He made him in his very image. He crowned him with glory and honor. Well, that's a mistake. He made him to have dominion over the works of the hands. That's right. He gave man dominion. Well, why does it say that? I don't, can't tell you why they translate it that way, but I can tell you this. It's an error. Because the word angels, when I put the cursor over it, notice, it is the word Elohim. Elohim is the word for God. It is never the word for angels. Look at the translation here. This is the usage of it, the way it's been translated. 2,046 times is God. 244 is God. Five is judge. One is God. God is great, mighty. Angels one time. The rest of them all related to God. So that shows you that this is erroneous because there's a different word for angels, a specific word, and it's not even used until we come to Genesis chapter 16, verse 7, where it says, the angel of the Lord. This is the word malach. That's the word for angel. So this is not a talk. When it says man was made a little lower than angels, is a false translation. It's a mistake. People that want to subscribe to the King James Version being the perfect version, <laughs> this destroys that right here. It is not by any means. They did not translate things correctly here or in multitude of places as we have shown you over time. So God made him a little lower than God. And remember that he made a, set him in the garden. We saw that he set him in the garden there in chapter 2, and now we come to verse 15. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden. Notice, to dress it, he was to work it, and also to keep it. Keep it is this word shamar, which means to guard it. So he's not only to work it and dress it, but he's also to guard it. Now, why would God tell him that, he might have, that he's going to have to maybe guard, he's going to have to guard this thing? Well, that would reveal that an enemy would, might try to come to the garden and he has to be ready to deal with it. Well, that would point towards the fact that there were going to be some enemies that would be coming, that would occur, this, this thing would occur. So, we'll see that shortly. Now, this doesn't mean, by the way, that, the, that Lucifer, who fell, which we'll look at in a moment, and became Satan, he was the angel leading the praise and worship in heaven, that he had already fallen. No. This means that it would occur. It hadn't occurred yet. How do you know it hadn't occurred yet? Because, we'll jump over to here to Ezekiel chapter 28. We see in chapter 28, verse 13, speaking about the, de the Lucifer who was the a cher a covering cherub in the heaven before the fall, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. He was there when the creation was done. As he was put in there, he, he, he was there with probably all these other angels that were there. Every precious stone was his covering. He was a beautiful creature, remember? He had tremendous beauty. And here's all these precious stones that were covering him. The sardis, the topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. And he was the leader of the praise and worship in heaven. The workmanship of thy tabrets. This means timbrels and tambourine. So that refers to rhythm. 
and of the pipes. This is referring to the instruments, be like pipes. So this is talking about instruments and rhythm. What? It was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. This is talking about a created being. And who was that? Angels were created beings. And so, he was the leader of the praise and worship in heaven. All these things were in him. Music was in him. Of course, that's why the devil has used music to try to deceive the whole world with all kinds of things. He's used music to, to deceive people away from the ways of the Lord because music was in him from the very beginning. So that shows you the fact that he was in Eden. He was in the garden of God. And so that shows you the fact that he saw everything that happened. He was not, the fall had not occurred yet. Well, he went back to heaven, certainly, after that. And we come to Isaiah chapter 14, because you have to understand angels are crea created beings. They're not in the image of God. Well, what did these guys, what did they think about the fact that man now was made in the very image of God? That he was going to have a family. They didn't like it whatsoever. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart. What happened? He had a wrong attitude that came into his heart. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And he says, I will be like the Most High. Remember, he was made in the likeness of God. This is number 1819, which is the root of 1823, which is the word we saw for the likeness of God back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. He wanted to be like, and this happens to be in the Hithpel, the Hithpel stem. So this is talking about and put the cursor over it, he wanted to be himself like. This is when it's talking, it's a reflexive type of, of a, a um, the hith pale is, the verb is. So it's talking about, I will be in the, I will be like him myself, the Most High. I will be in his likeness. Otherwise, they didn't like the fact that man was made in the very image of God. They wanted to be like him as well. So, of course, they rebelled. What happened? He says, you'll begin brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now, what do we see when this happened? And this is actually what happened. It declares the day when this all came down on Lucifer. Ezekiel 28. First of all, Ezekiel 28 is talking about him in this chapter, but first it's talking about a man who was a real man named Prince of Tyrus. Verse 2 is, Say unto the Prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart's lifted up, is what Satan, of course, put into this man, and thou hast said, I am a God. A lot of these ones who were rulers thought they were like a God, because they all wanted to be like a God, because the devil would bring them to that place. They weren't happy to be in their state they were in. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, and yet God says, Yet yeah, you're a man and not God though you set their heart as the heart of God. This is the prince of Tyrus. Well, we come down to verse 12. That was a man, see, ruling. And now it talks about the king of Tyrus. A king is over the prince. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Well, this is the one who's over this prince. And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Who is full of wisdom and perfect in beauty? Lucifer was. He had tremendous wisdom, and he was a beautiful creature with all his jewels and all the different things that he's covering that he had. He says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your, was your covering, the workmanship of your, your tab, timbrels and tambourines, rhythm, and the pipes, music, was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So this is talking about a created being, an angel. This is talking about Lucifer, who was over this particular prince, at the time when it's speaking of, in, when he was in Eden. But here he says what he was, the anointed cherub that covereth. What's he talking about covering? Covering the throne of God. He was in heaven. 
and I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou wast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You see, you got to understand that the angels, they were in different classifications. There were angels that were praised and worship angels, which is what Lucifer was the leader of. But there was also the warrior angels. Michael was the leader of the warrior angels. And Gabriel is the leader of the messenger angels. And we see, thou wast perfect in thy ways, because God makes everything perfect. From the day that thou wast created, again, created, angels were created, till unrighteousness, iniquity is the word unrighteousness here, was found in thee. Well, that meant he's the one who originated the sin. Unrighteousness was found in him. God didn't make him anybody and have any sin in them. They were perfect in all their ways. He is the one who unrighteousness was found in him. By the multitude of thy merchants, they filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, in the midst of the stones of fire. Now this was all discovered when he, after they went back to heaven, and there was a rebellion against God. And so, of course, God saw this iniquity, this unrighteousness in him. And remember, this was unrighteousness was found in him. He was perfect initially. And so now he's going to be cast out. He said, thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Yeah, yeah, pride got a hold of him. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom, which we had great wisdom before, by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled the sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities. This is why the heavens had to be cleansed, why Jesus had to go up with his blood and cleanse the heavens. They just didn't need to be cleansed down on earth in the tabernacle that was down there, which is a likeness of the one in heaven. They had to cleanse what was up in the heavens as well. We'll see that at a later time because of the iniquity that actually contaminated heaven as well. By the iniquity of the traffic, therefore will I bring a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I'll bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that shall behold thee. So, this is when this happened, and he was kicked out of heaven. It wasn't just Lucifer, because we see in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, if God spared not the angels, plural, now there were a whole bunch of them that joined him, that sinned, that came in line with him. There was a rebellion, not just a one, but a group, a whole group of them. If God, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved in the judgment. Chains don't refer to a, a, a a physical thing or like a place, so to speak, it refers to a state that they're in. A state. The chains of darkness means they are stuck in darkness. They never can come to the light. They're done. They're finished. There is no reconciliation for angels. There have been some people that have taught. Ultimate reconciliation will God, he'll, he'll reconcile everybody. No, he won't. Angels are not reconciled that have fallen. They're done. Their judgment is set. They're delivered into these chains, which is the state of being in darkness where they never can come out of it. And they're to be reserved in judgment. This is a perfect tense, meaning past completed action with ongoing effects at the time of speaking. It's a set, done deal. They're going to be judged. They are in trouble. We also see over in Jude speaks of this. In verse 6, the angels, plural, which kept not their first estate. Ah, they, didn't, they went along with Lucifer in the rebellion against God. Ah, they, all, they rebelled against him. Here it says, they left their own habitation. He reserved again in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. They are going to be judged. And we see that it speaks about this. We see over in Revelation chapter 12, when we see, <clears throat> talks here about, in verse 4, this is talking about referring to the devil, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. It was one-third of the angels that fell with him and cast them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman. That's what's going to happen to them 
when Jesus begins to take the authority after the 6,000 years is over, which is coming, and he's, there's going to be war in the heavens, and these spirits are all going to be cast down uh, to the earth. There's going to be a tremendous uh, warfare that's going to happen, and that comes down here in verse 7, which will happen. The war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. So one-third of the angels fell, and they went along with Satan. What a mistake. So now they're in everlasting chains under darkness. So, remember what it said back in Genesis, the fact that he said he was supposed to dress it, but he was also supposed to guard it. Now that Satan, I guess this is really a prophetic statement, you're going to guard this. Hadn't happened, he hadn't fallen yet, remember, because he was in Eden when all this was. But after they went back to heaven and they rebelled, they didn't like the situation and iniquity was found him. He's cast out with all the angels that rebelled against him. There was a rebellion in heaven that went on. So, man's supposed to be guarding this. And remember, he says in verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Literally, there's two words for die here in the Hebrew. And it really says, in dying, thou shalt die. Because spiritual death would occur immediately, and physical death would follow after. And that's exactly what happened to him. He died immediately spiritually, and he didn't die physically until after 930 years. It says that in Genesis 5, verse 5. All the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. But he died immediately when... The partook of, of course, the, the fruit of the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But we come to Genesis chapter 3, and now, this is after Satan had, now Lucifer had fallen, his name's changed to Satan, the adversary, and he comes through the serpent. He's called the old serpent. The serpent more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, he didn't come to the man, he came to the woman. Yea, yet God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden. Remember what was in the midst of the garden? It was the tree of life, wasn't it? In the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Was that recorded? No. Did God say you can't eat or touch of the tree in the midst of the garden? Absolutely not. Let's go back and make sure that's what it really says. This is what God said. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. Well, that was a good thing they were supposed to partake of. And then there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, when she made this statement here in chapter 3, verse 3 here, <coughs> you shall not eat of it, that's false, neither shall you touch it, Nothing, anything about touching it. Lest you die, she didn't have the Word of God straight whatsoever. That shows you something. If you don't have the Word of God straight in you, you could be deceived real easily and believe lies. And she, of course, didn't have things straight whatsoever. Of course, the devil picked up on this immediately. He knew she didn't have things right at all. The serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. You know, of course, challenging what God had said that if you do eat the fruit of the knowledge of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not the one that's in the midst of it, but you're not going to die. God does know in the day you eat thereof that your eyes shall be opened, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Meaning now there's going to be something that you are going to can become that you aren't now. Well, they were made in the very image of God. Why would they, you know, and they could have fellowship with God and know him. Here he's appealing now to them that there's something else that they should have. When the woman saw the tree was good for food, saw in the senses that it was pleasant to the eyes, the senses, a tree desired to make one wise, and get something that they didn't have available already, <clears throat> which is all lies. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. 
So they both partook of that fruit, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was forbidden. And what did God say? You're going to die immediately. Spiritual death occurred immediately. Now, 1 Timothy tells us a little more about this occurrence. In verse chapter 2, verse 14, he says, Adam was not deceived. He knew what he was doing. He knew that he was not supposed to partake of that fruit. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression as well because she was a participant in it. She was deceived because she didn't know the word of God. Anybody that doesn't know the word is going to be deceived. Well, Adam was not deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing. And remember who, was, who the first person was Adam was created. And so what happened? He was given the authority, wasn't he? And now he's spiritually dead and separated. Of course, what was the result of this? Well, now that he had spiritually died, we see what the result was in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, it wasn't there before, Adam let it in. Death by sin, that's the result, so death passed upon all men for that all of sin. Both of them were spiritually dead. And what's going to happen? Spiritually dead man and woman are going to produce spiritually dead children. And so the entire human race was spiritually dead, separated from God. That was the situation that occurred after that. But remember also, it was the serpent who he obeyed by doing this. And that was the devil coming through the serpent. Well, he had authority, remember? What would happen if he submitted to somebody else as far as the authority he had? What would happen? It got transferred into the hands of Satan. Luke chapter 4, verse 6, Satan declared this to Jesus in the temptation. If we go back here, when Luke 4, 5, he took him up to the high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Well, why would he have all these kingdoms? Because he had the authority and could rule and reign over the world. Well, how did he get that? He says in verse 6, The devil said unto him, All this authority, not power, dunamis, it's the word exousia that means authority, as Young's brings out. All this authority will I give thee, and the glory of them, of all these kingdoms. For that is delivered or given into the hands of another it was given to him. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. So Satan's sitting there saying, I have the authority. It was given unto me, and I can give it to whoever I want. Now, did Jesus dispute that statement? No. He didn't dispute it because it was true. The authority was given into the hands of Satan. Here's the temptation, though. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Jesus just answered that, dealt with the temptation, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God only, and him only shalt thou serve. But he did not dispute this, what he declared, because Satan did become the one who had authority. We see over in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it calls him, in whom the God of this, not world, but age, meaning this is only for an age, not forever just for the particular age, which would be the age that man had the lease of 6,000 years to rule over the earth. In whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of those that believe not. We see in Ephesians, speaking of what Satan's position was at this point, where in time past you walked according to the course or the age, this word aeon means age, of this world, According to the prince, the word prince means the ruler. The ruler of the, the word power is not power. Dunamis is the Greek word for power. This again is the word exousia. The King James has done a miserable job in translating the word exousia. In fact, to show you, this is the word exousia. It means authority. The majority of the time, 69 times, it translated power erroneously. It means authority 29 times correctly. It means authority. The word dunamis is the word for power. So this is talking about the ruler of the authority of the air. He's the ruler over the earth. The spirit that now works 
and the children of disobedience. We see over in John chapter 14, it even speaks of him as well. Jesus spoke of him when he talked about how he was coming. I'll not talk much with you for the ruler of this wor world, this is the word for world, cosmos cometh. <clears throat> so he's called the ruler of the authority of the air, he's called the ruler of the world, he's called the God of this age. And we have to understand when he got authority, well, the, whole, the whole world's under his control. We see it over in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, the statement that's made. We know that we're of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness or in the control of the evil one, more specifically. Yeah, he's the one who rules and was reigned over it. Not only did he rule over the earth, but also because man submitted unto him, and he now was spiritually dead, what else did happen? Satan actually became the spiritual father of mankind. We see this in John chapter 8, verse 44, because he wasn't now in relationship to the God any longer. John 8, 44, Jesus makes this statement to the religious people of the day. He said, you are of your father, the devil. So he says, who's their spiritual father? It's the devil. And the lust of your father he, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. Of course, when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. Because remember, he's in darkness now. The devil's nothing but a liar. He'll speak all kinds of lies. He's a liar, and he is the father of it. So here's the state. <laughs> Satan's now got the authority over the earth. He's the spiritual father of mankind. Man is spiritually dead to God. God has no relationship with them whatsoever. The earth that he gave is a lease for the, into the hands of man to rule for 6,000 years. Now the enemy who had rebelled against him in heaven is in control of it. And God's not in control of it at this point in time. And of course, because of sin, the earth's cursed and it's doomed and it's going to be burned up. That's what's going to happen. Well, God must understand in his all knowledge of all things, he understood all this stuff, and he had a wisdom. He, he had some, a mystery plan from the very beginning. 1 Corinthians 2, 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, a hidden thing, a secret thing. Even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the age, aeon, not world, unto our glory. It was set before the age even started. In fact, when it talks about the age here, this is plural. Before, here it is, plural, the word for age, the ages. That's why Young's translates it correctly, ages, because there are multiple ages, as we see. There were the ages up to the Old Testament time, there's the New Testament age, there's the millennial age. And then there's the eternal age that occurs after that, these ages, different ages that there are. That's why it's plural. In Romans chapter 16, verse 25, Now unto him that's of power, this is dunamai, meaning power, to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since... The, the, this says the world began, but it's actually since time really began, Kronos, when, since the beginning of time it's talking about. So again, this was a mystery, and Paul's the one who got the revelation of all this. He got the revelation of the mystery. We see it again speaking of this in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. How that by revelation... He made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in, or under, this really means the running, the understanding, synesis is from the word understanding. My understanding, or, yeah, here it is, understanding of the knowledge in the mystery of Christ. That's correct. Which in other ages, this doesn't mean ages, it means generations. It's a different word. In other generations, 
referring to previous generations to the time when Paul got the revelation from him, was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. It wasn't revealed until the New Testament age after they had gotten born again. We come to verse 9. To make all men see what's the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the age has been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So this is hidden. The, the world, the, the, nobody knew it out there whatsoever. It was all hidden in God. It had to be revealed. We see it again. This wasn't just mentioned once in a while. It mentioned all over the place. Colossians 1.26 Even the mystery which had been hid from the ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. So it came into revelation for all those who are in the New Testament era, the saints. Colossians 2.2, 2, their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the precise, correct knowledge of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. These are mysteries that are revealed by God. He speaks again of this mystery of Christ in chapter 4, verse 3. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us the door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I'm also in bond. This is the revelation of the mystery that had gone on from the very beginning. In fact, the devil didn't know about this. It even says, we read about this in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, but let's read verse 8 which none of the rulers, princes is archon rulers, of this age, who are the rulers of the age? All the ones who are under Satan's control, all of his evil spirits, principalities, powers, rulers, spiritual wickedness. None of them knew. They didn't know about this. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Because they didn't understand that through Jesus dying on the cross, as we will talk about down the road, that's how he could go through the avenue of death to get to him that the power of death, take back the keys of hell and death, accomplishing the redemption, and also make a way for man to be born from spiritual death into spiritual life. He did all that. He had to go through death to get it done. There was no other way. They would have never crucified the Lord of glory. They wanted to let him just live the way he was and never touch him. But they didn't understand what was going on. It was a mystery hidden in God. Well, was there even some idea what was going to happen? Well, yeah, God gave some information. Genesis 3, 15, he said, I will put enmity, he's speaking to Satan at this point, I will put enmity between thee, Satan, and the woman who has been treated terribly throughout history, women. Satan has always hated women and done evil things to them. Between thy seed, that's Satan's seed, which is what? All of mankind. Remember, he's the spiritual father of all mankind. And her seed. Her seed, that's a strange statement because the seed comes from the man. So what's the her seed talking about? The woman's going to have some seed. Not going to come from her. It's going to come from somebody else, which would be the Holy Spirit from God. But nonetheless, that is prophetic of the seed coming into a woman, which would be the virgin birth. The virgin birth. It shall bruise thy head. This seed, this one that's going to come, which is Jesus, is going to bruise and crush his head, his lordship over mankind, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Nonetheless, this one that comes that her seed, he's going to get bruised, his heel, and what's that talking about? I saw him about the crucifixion. He's going to, on the cross, remember? He's going to bruise his heel. And that happened. So this was given. Well, after this fall of man, we see that God, then the, they started to have children, and we have Cain, and then after that, we have Abel, and we see that Cain See, God instructed them on what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to bring the tithe unto God. The tithe, from the very beginning, God had the tithe. So Cain, did he obey? No, he brought a fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. He did whatever he wanted to do. 
Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And we talked about this is the birthright, right of the firstborn. We taught about this and we talked about the tithe. This is the firstborn offering. This is the firstlings of the fat, which is the tithe. So he brought the tithe. The Lord had a respect unto Abel and his offering because he obeyed him. But to Cain and his offering, he had not respect because he didn't. He just did whatever he wanted to do. He was in rebellion to God. So, of course, Cain was very wroth. His countenance fell. The Lord said, Why are you wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If you do well, shall you not be accepted? That tells us something. What we do is important. Because doing shows forth our works of obedience to God, which should bring forth fruit and shows that we're really following Him. Will you be accepted? Of course. But if you don't do well, sin lies at the door, meaning you're not doing right. You commit sin, and now you're not going to be accepted. And so that's exactly what happened. And of course, then he rose up and killed his brother Abel. This is, of course, is showing the ones who disobeyed God killed the ones who did obey God. There was a group that was obeying God, that were given, obeying His commands, but then there were those who were not obeying His commands. And by the way, as we pointed out in the past, this thing about the tithing was actually prophetically declared at this point in time that the same problem was going to come up later of one group bringing whatever they wanted to do and Abel the righteous one bringing the tithe. Because, this is a prophetic statement, it says in the King James, in the process of time it came to pass. It's a poor translation. Watch. This is the word process translated. It is the word which means end. It's the word kates in the Hebrew, it means end. It's translated that cons consistently. Process one time, erroneously, no reason to translate it that way whatsoever. It literally says, in the end of, and this doesn't mean time, this is the word yom, which means day. Translated day, 2008 times. Different word for time in the Hebrew. This is the word for day. And it happens to be plural. It's plural. Here's the word for day in the Hebrew. Notice that it's plural. So what's it talking about? As Young brings it out, it comes to pass at the end of days. Hmm. It was happening at the beginning, and it's a prophetic statement. It's going to happen at the end of days. And what do we see happening today in the church world? We see a tremendous number of Christians that have rejected tithing. They just do whatever they want to do, and they're in trouble. They are not going to be accepted. And yet we see those who are of Abel, the one righteous ones, who are bringing the tithe, because it was from the very beginning, as we have already taught in the past. Well, we see that, of course, he, Cain killed Abel, but what's, what's God going to do? Well, a Adam knew his wife again. She bare a son and called his name Seth. And Seth began then the, or continued on, let's put it this way, the lineage of the sons of God, the children of God, the ones who were following the way of the Lord. God said, she has appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom came, Cain slew. Well, now there were the sons of God line that got raised up. And we see in chapter 5, verse 1, or chapter 5, verse 1, that is, the book of the generation of Adam, the day that God created him in the likeness of God, made he him. And male and female, and he begins, this, begins to see these ones, and it starts going through them. How uh, Seth is now the next one, and then he goes on and talks about how long Seth uh, lived, and then he begot more of these ones, and this is the line, the righteous line that was obedient to God. There was Adam, there was Seth, there was Enos, there was Canaan, there was Mahaliel, there was Jared, and then we come to Enoch, and there was Methuselah and Lamech, and up to the time of Noah. This is the righteous line that was originally there because they, they obeyed God. This is actually quoted when we look at what is spoken in Luke chapter, we go backwards actually, from Luke chapter 3 verse 38 where it shows this lineage leading up here to the Son of God. The Son of God who was before that, Adam, who was before that, Seth, before then was that, after that was Enos, then Canaan, Mahaliel, 
Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. This is the line that was the sons of God line. They were the ones who were walking after the ways of God, being obedient. The rest of them, well, they, did, they walked after the ways that they wanted to walk after. They were the sons of men, and they were the ones that were disobedient to God. We see Genesis 5, verse 18. Here it speaks about begetting Enoch. Well, Enoch was one who walked with God. Verse 24, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That's all pointing towards, of course, Enoch was one. Enoch means dedicated. And that's all prophetic of the church that will be the dedicated, holy church that's going to walk with God. And they're going to be caught, they're not, they're not going to suffer death. They're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. This is all a type of the rapture that is going to occur. So God took him. Well, they had the sons of God lying, but... There were problems. Things got worse and worse and worse. Genesis chapter 6 came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Daughters were born unto them. The sons of God, that's the godly line, following God, saw the daughters of men. Didn't say the daughters of God, but the daughters of men, because the sons of God and the daughters of God were the godly line followed God. The daughters of men or the sons of men were the ungodly line that rebelled against him, just like what Cain did. Well, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, they were beautiful, and they took them wives of all they chose. <laughs> Instead of choosing one that was walking right with God, uh, they let the lust take control of them and chose the ones that they wanted, whatever they wanted. And the Lord said, of course he didn't like that, because they, weren't, they were choosing the wrong one. They were choosing the rebellious daughters. The daughters of men were the rebellious daughters, see. The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. It goes on, and the King James says, For that he also is flesh. Well, you missed something big time here. Because when we see the word flesh, here's this word, basar, which is the word for flesh. But there's another Hebrew word, that they did not translate. It is this word shagog, which means to go astray or err, commit sin or be erring. That's why Young's translates it correctly. In their erring, their flesh. What he's saying is my spirit's not always going to strive with mankind because in, as he's flesh, he's erring. He's continually walking in the ways of sin. Otherwise, he's seeing these guys are continually walking in the ways of sin. They're not walking right at all. And remember, they were given dominion for 6,000 years and it got transferred in the hands of Satan. Then, the word yet is not there in the Hebrew. It simply says, His days shall be, more literally, 120 years. <clears throat> now, is that talking about his lifespan? No. How do we know it's not talking about his lifespan? Because if his days were 120 years, that'd be the end. You can't live over 120 years, right? Well, this is Genesis 6, 3. Let's go forward and see how some of the people lived, how long they lived. Genesis 25, verse 7. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, 103 score and 15. That's 175 years. Well, that's more than 120. He was living 175 years. How about in verse 17, even talking about Ishmael? Ishmael was 137 years he lived. He lived quite a long time. Not any 120 years whatsoever. We come to chapter 35, verse 28, talking about Isaac. Look what's it say about him. The days of Isaac were 104 score, 180 years he lived. Well, now that's a third one. And then we even come to see Jacob. In Genesis 47, verse 9, he said to Pharaoh, the days of my pilgrims are 130 years. Huh. 120 years can't mean time of the of a length of life. It doesn't mean that. It's talking about something totally different. 
So what is he talking about? God would never say anything that wasn't true. It is true. What's this 120 years? And what's this about his days? Well, what were the days that he was given authority? For 6,000 years. So what are these 120 years? These are jubilee years in God's sight. God had jubilee years every 50 years. In 50 years, then the, the people, if they'd been in any kind of bondage or whatever, they went free and were restored back. Their possessions were restored. They were restored back to their households and so forth. These are jubilee years. 120 times 50 is 6,000 years. Man's years. This is talking about man's time of when, how he was in control of the earth. Here, my spirit is not going to strive with man. <laughs> He's air in his flesh. His days, though, are 6,000 years, and this wasn't even, you know, this wasn't very long. So it's a long way to go. Now, verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. Notice that. There were giants. These are commonly called the Nephilim. They're from the word Nephil. The root of this means fall or fallen ones. Many people have, a, have come up with a real false teaching on this one. They have said that the giants are the product of the fallen angels with the daughters of men that they were, they were, they were fair. Because they say that the sons of God, these sons of God, as we'll see, go back and see, were fallen angels. This means sons, this means God. If God said sons of God, it means sons of God. It doesn't mean fallen angels. And it's not talking about fallen angels. It's all lies, lying teachings. These ones, the Nephilim, is really talking about those who are fierce warriors. If we look at TWO2, this is the theological word book of the Old Testament. It's very good, it's outstanding. And I'm going to show you this, what they state. 1393. 1393, it speaks about the giants of the Nephilim. And it's in here, it's talking about this subject. Oh, 1393, let's go back here and get. He speaks here, and he talks about, well, some scholars attempt to put this term etymologically in this Nepal. It's not so. It has a proposal of a root here where to be wonderful, strong, or mighty, as it says. But he comes down this pattern of semantically related groups of weak verbs. There's, a, there's weak verb, this type of verbs in Hebrew, with two strong consonants and co consonants in common, is a notably recurrent phenomenon, phenomenon in Hebrew lexicography, lexography. Actually, the translation giants is supported mainly by the LXX. That is the Septuagint re, uh, translation which made that. And may be quite misleading. That's what, the word may be of unknown origin and mean heroes or fierce warriors. Fierce warriors. The, some of them just translated it Nephilim because they didn't know what to do with it. But instead, it's talking about, they think it means fierce warriors, and they were right. Because the fallen ones were these fierce warriors who had not walked in the ways of God, and because of the sin that came into them, they became violent, fierce wa warriors. Now, let's point out another thing. The giants were already here. Okay? So, and the people are saying that it's the fallen angels mating with the women that produced the giants. Look at what it says, where they come up with this. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. This means after, the following part behind. Afterwards in time. Of time. So what happened first? The, the giants were already here. What's happening afterwards in time? The next statement. 
The sons of God came into the daughters of men and bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which are of old men of renown. And they try to say that these were fallen angels mating with the women and producing these hybrid, crazy, you know, a, uh, demonic angel men people. It's crazy. The Nephilim. It's totally wrong. It's all false teaching. Number one, when it talks about men, this is the word Enosh, which means mortal man. It's talking about a subject to death man. It's talking about an actual flesh and blood person. Furthermore, the sons of God, God line, came into the daughters of men. Mistake, they weren't supposed to be with them, but they did. They were in rebellion. Bear children to them, became mighty, strong and mighty. And they were mortal men famous mortal men. Now, the teaching is, many people say, well, the sons of God came to the daughters of men and produced the giants. That's what they all say. Wait a minute. Let's look at this again. The giants were here, and after in time, well, the giants were already here. So the sons of God coming to the daughters of men didn't produce the giants. They were already here. So could this be a true teaching that they have? No, it's total lies. Where'd they get it from? They got it from the Book of Enoch, which is a false book, which is all lies. The Book of Enoch is evil. It is absolutely got so many false statements in it, it's astounding. Anybody that teaches or believes the Book of Enoch is false teachers. And there's a whole lot of them all over the place. It's a mistake. In fact, let me just tell you a few. This is just a summary of some of the false statements out of the Book of Enoch. In the Book of Enoch, here's I got 17 of them that I've copied up right here. They, they say in the Book of Enoch that God will tread upon the earth on Mount Sinai. No, he's not coming on Mount Sinai. He's coming on Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14.4. They say judgment comes upon all, even upon the righteous. That's a lie. The judgment comes on the church and the righteous are saved and the judgment's coming on all the ungodly. They say all on the earth are going to perish. Well, that's a lie because Isaiah 24, 6 says there's going to be few men are going to be left and Matthew 24, 22 says except the days are shortened, no flesh be saved and since the days were shortened, there were flesh that were saved and they go on in to populate the during the millennial reign, that's where all the nations come. So, did all men be eliminated? No. They say the earth was filled with water and clouds and dew and rain. Well, that's a lie. Before the flood, there was no rain. Why? Because God had not caused it to rain, it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. A mist watered the earth, is what it says. They say the angels were the sons of heaven. Well, that's because that's what they wanted to be. They weren't the sons of heaven. They were created beings. They weren't sons whatsoever. It's all a lie. They're created beings. They say the angels chose wives and beget the children, and the, but that's a lie because angels don't marry and they don't reproduce. They're all male. They don't reproduce. They don't reproduce. It's all a lie. They say the sons of God were angels that took wives and, and then they produced the, as they call it, these giants. Well, we already saw the giants were already here. They had nothing to do with producing them. In fact, they produced men, mortal men, who were famous, who were mighty men. Nothing to do whatsoever about any hybrid angels. They say the name of the leader of their angels, and they got all these other names for angels in it. Well, that's false, because there's only three angels that are mentioned, Michael and Gabriel and Lucifer. In fact, remember in Judges chapter 13, when the name of the, the, the guy, the, they wanted to know, what's, what's your name And the angel? And the angel said, it's secret. They didn't give their names. All these other ones are all false lies. The angels say, 200 angels supposedly conspired together to sin by taking wives and impregnating them. <laughs> that had nothing to do with man's disobedience and rebellion against God that brought sin into the world. And they couldn't do that anyway because they couldn't procreate lies. 
They say the stature of giants is 300 L's. <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, L was one, one and a half feet. That times, that's 450 feet tall. 450 feet tall. Uh, show me the archaeological evidence of that one. There isn't any. It's all lies. They say the earth reproved the unrighteous. No, it didn't. God's the one who judged them and reproved the unrighteous. They say Enoch was contemporary with Noah, lived the same times as Noah. Well, that's impossible because Enoch lived 365 years. He had begot Methuselah at age 65. You can just follow this. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech, so Enoch was 252 years old at the time that when Lamech was born. He lived 182 years and begat Noah, which would make Enoch 434 years at Noah's birth. How old was Noah, uh, Enoch when he got removed? Was he 434 years? No, he was 365 years. He was long gone before Noah came on the scene. It's a lie. They also say that Gabriel was told to destroy the, was go, told to go and destroy the children of fornication, set over all the powers. Gabriel's a messenger angel. He's not a warrior angel. They say Michael was told to go to announce and be merciful. He's merciful and long suffering. No, he's not. He's a warrior angel that goes to destroy. They say another angel named Faniel was set over repentance of hope of those who inherit eternal life. Lies. Jesus is the only mediator whatsoever. They even say, and this is because what they like, that Enoch was, they asked Enoch to pray intercession for the angels to find forgiveness with God so they could be reconciled. It's all lies. This is all in the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is an abomination. It is a lie, it is false, and it's astounding how many ministers today uh, consider it true. In fact, some people, I've seen lots of articles say, should the book of Enoch really be in the Bible? It, it should be in the Bible. They think it should be a part of the Bible. They almost hold it as truth of Scripture. It's a lie. Total deception. Total lies. Well, what do we see happen? Genesis 6, 5, God saw the wickedness of man, mankind, was great in the earth. The ever imag imagination, the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. He repented the Lord that he made man on the earth. It grieved him at his heart. So what's he going to do? He's going to destroy him. I'm going to destroy man I've created from the face of the earth. He's going to destroy the whole deal, including all the beasts, creeping things, fowls of the air. He's going to get rid of the whole thing. But... One man found grace in his sight. That was Noah. Found grace in the sight of the Lord. Noah means rest. And prophetic of the fact that there's going to come a rest. And that will be the ones who enter into the spiritual rest. The ones who are going to be. And that's, of course, what the, num the Sabbath means what? Rest. That's the seventh day. That's going to be the time when the millennial reign of Jesus, that'll be the time when we've entered into rest and we'll be ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, God proceeded, of course. He's going to destroy the place. Verse 11, the earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. They got so bad. You know, Noah was the only one, about the only one left. And his family, the only ones that got saved. All the rest of them had corrupt themselves. It says, Behold, it was corrupt all flesh and crept its way upon the earth. It got so bad. And so he said, The end of all flesh has come. We're going to get rid of them all, except, of course, Noah and his family. So he had him make an ark to be protected. And he also made a covenant with him that he would establish the covenant they would come into this ark with him. And, the, of course, he brought him into the ark and... He came through. He was protected while the judgment came. The waters came and destroyed them all. But we'll finish up with one last thing. Genesis chapter 8, verse 4. After the flood was over and the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Oh, that's a significant statement. Because after the flood was gone, now we're in the seventh month. The seventh month is prophetic of the end time work 
of God because the seventh month is the month of the three final feasts of, of the Feast of Trumpets, which is the rapture of the church, the Day of Atonement, which is the judgment on the nations, and the Feast of tr Trumpets, or excuse me, Feast of Tabernacles, which is the millennial reign of Jesus, the rapture, the judgment, and then the millennial reign. The seventh month, the Tabernacles begins on the 15th day to the 21st. This is the 17th day. And when it talks about the 17th day, we have seen this in the past, and we'll go over it as we go. The 17th day is prophetic of the change that is going to come, the reversal of the evil in the earth. You're going to see that at a later time. But also notice, the earth was under a curse. But look what it says. It rested on the mountains of Ararat. And what does Ararat mean? The curse reversed. Who was born at the time of tabernacles? Probably on the 17th day. Jesus was born at tabernacles. This would be speaking of Jesus coming, who is our rest, who's going to bring us into rest. At the time of tabernacles, it wasn't December 25th, that's a lie. <laughs> time of tabernacles to reverse the curse that was upon the earth. And Jesus is the one who did come. He came to accomplish the redemption and to see man be restored and come to the place of being born from death unto spiritual life and be restored back into relationship with God. And here, this is all prophetic of that. At the end of the flood, it's a new day, and here it's prophetic of what's going to happen. Jesus is going to come, and he is going to reverse the curse that has come. So we see what has happened up to this point, and then you're going to see how God begins to deal with man in covenants. We'll begin to talk about, review what we talked about, and go through this uh, on uh, Sunday when we continue on this subject about the tremendous work that God has accomplished. So we see what's this is hidden from God, this mystery from the very beginning. Tremendous thing that God has set. And this is the fact that He is going to have a people who are going to be a family. All the ones who are the unrighteous ones, they get destroyed. But the righteous ones, the holy ones, will be a part of the family of God, and He will have that. Because at the end of after the earth is burned up, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. Only the righteous, only righteousness will be there, the righteous ones. Those are the ones that have followed the way of the Lord and are going to be with him. And that's when the Father is going to come because the new Jerusalem is going to come down and it's going to be in this new heavens and new earth and we're going to be tabernacling with the Father and with Jesus. Of course, what are we to do now? We're to be, of course, walking in the way of the Lord, working out our own salvation, preaching the gospel to others, helping them to come to the Lord and, and learn the ways of the Lord and follow Him so that they can be a part of this righteous group. Tremendous plan hidden in God from the very beginning to bring forth the family of God. God will have a righteous family in the end. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation of what has happened from the very beginning. I thank you that I see the fall of man and the destruction that had come. Yet there was a Sons of God line that led all the way up to Jesus. That Sons of God line, which was Noah was a part of, he was preserved while the rest of the wicked were destroyed. And when the ark that he was in rested in the seventh month, the seventeenth day, it spoke of the coming of Jesus to accomplish the redemption, to reverse the curse, to deliver us from the evil. I thank you for the great work that Jesus Christ has accomplished. And I thank you for this revelation of redemption 
as I understand it, I will see the reality of the work of God in the earth. And I thank you. I will be working out my salvation. I will be totally cleansed. I will be pure and holy. I will be righteous. I will be a part of the family of God. I thank you, Lord, for the revelation from the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for the things we brought forth thus far. Thank you for the things that we're going to be coming forth as we're going to be declaring this tremendous work that Jesus has accomplished and showing how it came into being. And also we'll be seeing what is coming down the line. Father, we thank you for the great work that you have brought forth and the revelation in the Word of God of this mystery that's been hidden from the ages but is now revealed unto us. Thank you, Father. We will be here as endures your word and see your total work done in our lives so we will be oh, oh, those ones that are of the righteous. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.